You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. It's time to see what's making the headlines with the Jewish Chronicles editor, Jake Wallace-Simons, and the Guardian columnist, Zoe Williams. They'll be with us from now until just before midnight. Welcome. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. Well, the eye says Conservative MPs from what it calls all wings of the fractured party are poised to rebel against Rishi Sunak's Rwanda migration plan. The Times quotes from the government's of official legal advice describing the Prime Minister's chances of getting the legislation over the line as 50% at best. Robert Jenrick, the minister who resigned over changes to the Rwanda plan earlier this week, gives a warning in The Telegraph that there are too many migrants coming to the UK and can actually be integrated into life here. The Guardian says the Home Office has been ordered by the parliamentary spending watchdog to reveal the full cost of the Rwanda plan after news this week that it has already hit £290 million. The FT reports that difficulties in the key trade routes on the Panama and Suez canals are putting, as the headline says, supply chains at risk for Christmas. The Sun claims an exclusive with Palace Insiders, saying that the King is refusing to be emotionally blackmailed by Prince Harry over allegations about the royal family in his recent book, Spare. According to The Express, five million Britons plan to spend this Christmas abroad. And as such, they're likely to be untroubled by the UK's Santa shortage, reported on the front of the star. While the Mirror carries allegations that images of Nigel Farage have been doctored in an effort to help him win I'm a Celebrity. Hmm, intrigued. <laughs> Doctored how? <laughs> and a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by Jake Wallace-Simons and Zoe Williams. Welcome to you again. Thank you. Let us start with um, Rwanda and uh, the eye, first of all. And uh, Rishi Sunak, uh, beset on all sides by Tory uh, divisions each and every way he turns. It's actually very reminiscent of Brexit, this, because even though it says he's beset on every side, it's a fractured party, the, the left of the Tories are against him and the right, you can tell from the mood music that the people who are making most noise are the people trying to outflank him to the right and make the policy harder. So even while there are probably a, a number of rebels and quite legitimate voices in that party saying, who are still quite attached to the rule of law, the only voices you're going to hear, both in the headlines and in the kind of whispering campaigns, will be your Jenricks and your Bravermans saying that, that he's not being tough enough, when he's being way tougher than he actually can afford. Jake, do you, do you agree with that? Are we only really going to be hearing from the, the right? Well, I think, I mean, you're right, Zoe, they are making the, the loudest noise, uh, and in a way for good reason, because voters do feel very betrayed on this, particularly Tory voters. The people who voted Tory in 2019, uh, immigration by 11 points is their top priority, getting it down. Uh, and they've merged together the illegal migration on the small boats with legal migration, which is peaking at 745,000, which is a huge number compared to the manifesto commitment of 2019, which was to keep it to 226,000. But, but what's uh, amusing? So I, think, so I think that there is, there is a lot of noise coming from the Tory right, but at the same time, they're living rather in cloud cookie land because if he does pull out of the Human Rights Act, Rwanda would pull the plug on it. Yeah, and yeah. so that isn't a solution. Yeah. Uh, but, like you say, they're making a lot of noise. I think a lot of this is about positioning for the next parliament, expecting a win, and what's going to happen to the Tory party... Uh, sorry, expecting a lose, <laughs> an explanation, and what's going to happen to the Tory party after that. I mean, the thing is, is that it is sort of the consequence of Brexit. The reason legal migration is so high is because of all the deals they had to cut in order to get trade deals as agents operating outside the EU. So they made all these promises linked to Brexit of reducing migration, which have resulted in a massive surge in migration. Yeah, I'm sure they had to, but Boris did. I mean, the mobility yeah, I mean, was part of the deal with Australia and with India. What? And But Boris was probably the most pro-immigration prime minister we've ever had. I know, but... Uh, even but, more than Tony Blair. I mean, he is the one who really presides over this huge surge in migration, which is now causing the Tories such a lot of... Problems. But it's testament to the mendacity of the man that he actually came out as the kind of most ardent pro-Brexit candidate who would keep control of your borders, your laws and your money or whatever, when actually he was fine. He was fine with practically open borders. Yeah, but he was always <laughs> well, a big... He was, um, he was a sort of liberal, globalised... Was um, for uh, 
migration amnesty, wasn't he? An immigration amnesty. Yeah, 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 he's yeah, always yeah. been pro migration. He's, so he's, he's been, really he's not very Tory, really. And his vision of of Brexit was very was a globalised, you know, liberal, open Britain. It wasn't the sort of the, the Brexit that Nigel Farage. Wanted. But that's certainly not vision. the Brexit that he sold to 2019 voters. I wouldn't say. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I think 29 voters, 2019 voters wanted something very different and yeah, Boris yeah, just they had just, the charisma yeah, to cut yeah, through yeah, and there's yeah. a lot of projection. Yeah, we're not going down the Brexit road. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the, not, the discussion. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's move on to, to the Times. Also um, looking at Rwanda and the chance of success of this emergency bill uh, to be heard again on Tuesday. 50% at best, that's the headline. Oh, that's absolute disaster, isn't it? Let's face it, it's a disaster. And it, to me, it lo I look at it in the context of Richard Sunak's five pledges. And those five, pledge, five pledges were to grow the economy while well, the economy is flatlining, to cut the debt, the debt's gone from £2.2 trillion to £3 trillion, uh, pounds, to cut the NHS that waiting <laughs> list, cut the NHS waiting list, and they have risen all year, to halve inflation, well, that has happened, but off its own accord, and now to stop the boats is really the only thing that he's got left, and he's trying desperately to do it, and he's got a 50% chance of success at best. It's a real mess, and he's losing credibility with his own voters at this point where he really needs to gain that support and energise his base as if he's got any chance of winning in 2020. But he has been saying himself that, that immigration figures have come down under his watch, so... Immigration figures? Do you mean uh, boats? Illegal migration. Yeah, yeah. because yes. of the Albanians, because yeah, 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 the deal yeah, yeah. it came down by a third, and that's fine, because the Al he did a deal with so Albania. So he's pointing to that as and that's true. success. That is, that is a good success, but the overall picture is 745,000 migrants coming in and the boats are not stopped, and Rwanda, which is his flagship policy, is, looks like it's about to fail, or may very well be about to fail, and but beset by infighting. The whole thing is rather the, disastrous. The thing is, is that it's all performative anyway. There's very little chance that Rwanda would have had any impact on the small boat crossings because they, they, there's absolutely no documented evidence of deterrence working for people who are desperate enough to get on a dinghy. There's I, no I, evidence I of it. I disagree with that. I mean, no, it worked, it worked no, for Albania. No, there's no, worked for no, Albania. no, no, no. The, 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 what worked with Albania was doing a deal with the Albanian government to get the, them more stringent at stopping people leaving mm, it mm, wasn't mm. it wasn't persuading albanians that life but would it's be bad with australia, australia well, it, the it really it genuinely terrible. hasn't when you like when you and this has been going on since blair tried it when you try to persuade people that it's a bad idea to come to the uk because life will be more difficult for you you're desperately underestimating how difficult life is already and it makes very little difference. Well, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say to, to persuade them that life would be difficult here, but more that they won't be able to stay here. That's the thing. Mm, if they make the journey here, certainly in the many reports that, that we've done and have spoken to people who've, who've made the journey and asked them, you know, would you consider not to make that journey with the, the outcome that you might end up in Rwanda? And they've mm. said no. But they would say that, wouldn't they? Nobody takes it seriously. You know, nobody to, GB News recently, if I can mention them briefly, not in any glowing terms, I can mention them. They did this, this, this chat in, in Calais where they asked you what they thought of the Rwanda plan and people didn't take it seriously, I they know, thought but, it was but, a joke. But, but, I mean, but, I think, that, I think Jake, it's very... If you, see, if, you see, if you see deportations actually happening and people begin to take it seriously, then it will have no, an impact what, you, on people. You're massively, Why would people come here if they think they're going to be deported? You're massively underestimating how difficult the situations are that people are already in. So even the, the, people, even the question mark... You can't, you, it depends on the people. OK, well, obviously, I mean, the I'm Albanians. talking about refugees who have fled war but they're and not all ref, But they're not... But that's not, well, okay, by I any, mean, any got, stretch of imagination, some, all of like, the people on the boat. If you've got some mythical economic migrant whose life was fine before they just they were just chancing their arm in your, in your head, then fine, but to get... The Albanians. Well, the Albanians, the Albanians, Albanians, Albanians fleeing persecution and war. Wait a second. To get on a dinghy run by a trafficker, it's extremely dangerous. It's very, very arduous. It's very expensive. You arrive destitute. They're not doing it for fun. Why were the Albanians doing it then? Let's talk about the money. Um, that yeah. Let's. Well, let's Rishi Sunak says he hasn't uh, deceived um, people on disclosing the figure, 290 million. Um, he's defending himself on that, but. The, the way the figure came out, there's some discussion about that sort of breaking standards. I mean, it's, it's, it's striking to me that they, they've, been, they've been ordered to disclose, and yet we've already had disclosed that it's cost 290 million. So you think, how on earth much more could there be to come? That is 
uh, that is nearly a third of a billion pounds on a policy that means nothing, that has absolutely no concrete impact, that was effectively just an advert for the more unpleasant factors of Conservative thinking. So the idea that they could have spent more than 290 million is fanciful to me. Well, I don't know. It's I mean, in I, my I, paper, I, so it must be right. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I mean, it, it, is, it, is a, it is a huge sum. Uh, and the costs are set, according to The Guardian, uh, costs are set to pass 400 million quid. But this is an expensive business. I mean, it costs... The, the bill for housing illegal migrants uh, in hotels amounts to about 8 million a day. And that, that a lot of days to amount to 400 million. But it just is an illustration of how big the sums are. Well, they're, they're only... They're only... Here. But, but is, it, is, it, I, I, is it at the point... I would, but I would say... I, the only thing I would take issue with, I, I don't think that this is some kind of... Uh, a sort of uh, straw man policy that's po about posturing. He's really trying to get to grips with this crisis that voters care about, particularly Tory no, but, voters. But can and I, something's but can got I, to be done about it. But can I suggest it. something that people could, that the government could do that would be constructive, which would be to end the backlogs with that £400 million, oh, yeah. Get, yeah. The, the, get the absolutely entitled asylum seekers their asylum claim, and then they can have citizenship and start working, and they won't need to be in temporary accommodation. I, I, I mean, that, that would I mean, be it, a really creative that would be, I mean, the backlog and money-saving policy. The backlog is a, is a big problem, and the government has got to deal with that. And I think part of that is the unwieldy civil service. It isn't doing what the government wants it to not do. Not really, um, not really. No, yes, I mean, right it's, it's a kind of lack of funding and a lack of will and a lack, lack of, of interest, you know. Yeah. It's not the civil servant's fault, it's poor government. But, yes, I mean, a lot of people will, will look to that and think, why couldn't that money be spent yeah, yeah. on... Just on clearing the, the backlog. Clearing yeah. the backlog right, right. and then we'll be in this situation. Um, thank you both for the moment. Uh, we are going to take a break. Coming up. The US vetoes a UN resolution backing a ceasefire in Gaza. We'll discuss that next. You are watching the press preview, still with me, Jake Wallace-Simons and Zoe Williams. Um, we're going to take a look at the front page of the Daily Telegraph in this section. Um, and this UN vote this evening on the ceasefire in Gaza, which has been vetoed by the United States. Um, they said that it would be a denial, I think, of reality was the, the, the quote. Um, your thoughts on that? Well, I think, I think the US was quite right to veto that. It's absurd to, to call for a, for a ceasefire when Israel still faces uh, the terrorist threat from Hamas, which has vowed to do the same massacre again and again and again so far as it can. Yeah, the quote was um, divorced from reality. Divorced from reality. And the other quote that, that jumped out was that the US deputy ambassador said that this is not a threat that any of our governments would continue to allow. And it's interesting that the US was put under pressure from the following countries, Egypt, Qatar, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the Palestinian Authority and Turkey. Well, Turkey massacred Kurds in northern Syria. Egypt, the record of repressing the Arab Spring was woeful. Qatar is the main funder of Hamas and other terror groups around the world. Saudi Arabia is prosecuting a brutal war in Yemen. Uh, the Palestinian Authority is, is very brutal and authoritarian. And Jordan has its own problems. And so these are not democracies who are calling for the ceasefire. They do not have blood-free hands themselves. The majority of states at the UN are not democracies. I think we need to recognise that as tragic as the cost of war is and as hellish as war is, sometimes it's just unnecessary when you're under attack from such a gruesome threat that is using civilians as human shields. Sorry. Well, I mean, it's every nation in the UN who's called for a ceasefire, apart from the US, right? Is it? Yeah, it is. These, those were the only Well, countries... we didn't call for it. Britain didn't call for it. I'm sorry, I kind of forgot our role as America's little running door. No, 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 I don't think, um, I don't think, no, it's not every single... Well, it is, it is. In, it's, in the it's, it's, it's everyone, no, and it's then the, U, the it US... It is not every country The US in vetoed. The UN. No, it's not. It's, it's a majority... Look, according to this, the US... 13 used, out of 15, wasn't it? Veto. OK, but... But, um, um, but it's not... That's it's not there are 190 countries in the world. It's 13 out of 15, and the only two that didn't are the US, which is vetoing, and us for abstaining, right? So, so... So, no, it's so, not, but that's so, not every country so in the absolute, UN, is it? It's an absolute red herring for you to say, because Saudi Arabia has a poor human rights record, which, incidentally, America has never minded before, that that is not a legitimate th with pressure to put on the US. The reason this motion was even brought to be into being was because Article 99 had been, had been 
called for the first time sure. because the depredations in Gaza are so intense. But the UN, and, the UN and has to, totally the, discredited itself for no, years and years uh, that's, that's, by that's, isolating Israel and, picking, and subjecting Israel to, that's to absolutely double standards. not relevant. It, it is both it's relevant, not relevant and it's true. And it's the, under, the, the underlying truth, cause it, well, behind this Hang on a second, you have to let me talk. Um, yeah, you have been talking. No, no, I, um, ha I haven't. And we've both I, been talking. No, 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 you have to and let me finish a sentence, though. Do, do finish the, a sentence. Because the point is not whether or not the UN has discredited itself. The point is that the world is watching in horror at what's going on in Gaza, and everybody will eventually catch up with that. Now, I think the American move is actually because they have been working to, to kind of, they've said to, his, to Israel today, this can't carry on for another month. So they do want a ceasefire. They do, and, they, and I suspect the reason they vetoed this was because if Israel had to do it under UN, UN sanction, that would be a very different picture going forward than if Israel decides to do it of its own accord. But it's absolutely not the case. That, that, that this can just continue. I mean, people. But what they have watched is a, a temporary ceasefire. They haven't. What they said what that a ceasefire what, complete. What, what, the, what, what the US? Well, wants I mean, they're, they're, what... they're, they're trying to make. I mean, they are trying to put pressure on so that so that it comes out of a settlement rather than out of a of a pressure. Because if it comes out of a UN resolution, then that is a very different. We've only got about way to go. Twenty forward, seconds. Right? Jake, I'm going to give you the the last word. Look, you know, this is not the Iraq War. This is World War Two. Israel is facing an existential threat that it has to destroy. It cannot live with a genocidal enemy on its border that has not only carried out this massacre, okay. but has been open about its intention to do Jake, it again and, Zoe, and again and again. We are going to continue this discussion in the 11 hour, uh, but we're going to have to take a break and go to the weather now. Thank you both for the moment.